Welcome to Casual Friday. So today I want to start off with, I believe it's part five of my knitting library tour. I'm going to talk about uh, stitch dictionaries, the ones that I use most often when I'm designing texture patterns. So that could be knit purl, it could be a slip stitch pattern, it could be cables, it could be something like that. It's not color work, that's sort of a different category of stitch dictionary. I'm not going to show you every single stitch dictionary that I have, but I will show you the ones that I refer to most often. And I'll show you examples of how I have used stitch patterns from those stitch, stitch dictionaries in my designs. And then after that, I'll tell you a little bit about a design that I'm working on and some of the considerations that I'm making as I think about this design and the decisions that I'm making and how that's connected to a question I got in the past week or two about reversing the direction of knitting a sweater um, that was written bottom up and wanting to knit it top down. So I have links down in the description to each section of this video. Um, so you can jump right to that if that's something you want to do. So let's get started. I'm gonna start with the classic uh, stitch dictionaries. And um, these were stitch dictionaries that were recommended to me years ago. I got one of them and then later I got a second one. And then earlier this year, I finally got a third. And these are Barbara G. Walker's treasuries of st knitting stitch patterns. So the, the thing that is great about these stitch dictionaries, first of all, is they have hundreds and hundreds of stitch patterns in them. I think between the two, the first two books, there's something like 1,200 stitch patterns. Most of them, Walker will tell you, uh, were collected. They were either traditional or they were submitted by other people. Some of them she designed herself. You can never be sure which ones she designed herself. She will credit somebody who sent in an original design, but if it's a traditional design or one that she created herself, she is un she's not gonna differentiate. She's not going to take credit um, within her own book. So the first treasury, I and one of the things I do with some of my um, books that I use a lot is I take them to a copy center like uh, Kinko's FedEx here in the U.S. and I have them cut the binding off and then put in this uh, this spiral binding because then I can lay it flat or I can flip it inside out, whatever I want to do. Now, um, the downside of these stitch patterns is that they assume that you're knitting flat and the instructions are all written. So that means they're written in rows, so right side rows, wrong side rows. That means if you like working with charts, you will have to chart it yourself. Um, or if you're working in the round, you will have to convert the instructions to be to work in the round. These books came out in the 1970s and overwhelmingly Americans, and Barbara Walker's an American, uh, Americans knit flat in pieces and so, and with written instructions, and so that's how her stitch dictionaries were presented. The, the first treasury includes the most basic method of any particular type of stitch um, as sort of the basis. I mean, it includes way more than that, but for example, if you want to learn how to knit cables, if you want, she will have an example of a four or six stitch basic cable and with instructions for how to work it. And she often offers variations, like shows you what happens if you cross it less often and, and how that will affect the results. She has the most basic versions of lace in here, those stitch patterns are called fagoting, and they are different variations of how you alternate a decrease with a yarn over on every row in order to get a very open mesh fabric, but there's a number of different ways of doing that. So if you are looking for the most basic form of any sort of family of stitch patterns, it will be included in here, in addition to things that are much more complex than that. The second treasury is bigger, has more patterns in it, and it's actually my favorite of 
Uh, if I had to choose between the first and the second treasury, if I could only have one, I would choose the second because it's got more stitch patterns and more interesting stitch patterns. But again, it doesn't have the most basic versions of things. So when I was, as the example of the lace knitting, when I was trying to learn what those, how those patterns worked, I really needed the first treasury because she's not going to repeat it in the second one. What's in these stitch dictionaries are patterns that are based on texture. These are not color work patterns unless they are slip stitch patterns. So essentially slip stitch patterns are stripes. You're alternating uh, whether you're working a row in one color versus another co color and you can use slip stitches to make it look like you've got two colors in a row. So in, in those situations, she might include some color, but it does not include stranded color work. That's a different subset, but you'll see knit pearl patterns, you'll see cables, you'll see lace, you'll see, um, I don't know if the second treasury, if she includes mosaic, yes. So she invented mosaic stitch patterns, which are two colors, but not at the same time. They are a subset of slip stitch patterns. She invented those and she included a chapter in here on those patterns. She has a full book on mosaic patterns as well. Um, which I'm not going to show you today, but she just be aware that she has one of those. Her third treasury is called Charted Knitting Designs. And again, it was published in the 1970s when Americans were mostly knitting from written instructions. And what she did here was she created a pretty extensive charting system. She, there were some chart symbols that were already in use in some places, particularly in Europe and, and or with lace knitting. You'll see, you will, you will have seen some charted patterns uh, previously. But with cable patterns, she really kind of invented the system um, of how cables are represented in charts today. This was 1972. She had to hand draw all of her charts with graph paper and pencil. And so there's a period of time when people were charting cables, different publications, but they were having to create these symbols in a, in a way separate from how we do it today. Today, everybody's got a laptop or a desktop computer and you can get software that create that's charting software that allows you to just pick a symbol from a library, a cable symbol and, and pop it into the charting software. Um, and m many of those symbols are based on the symbols that she created. So this is a really nice uh, background on wh where charts came from that we use today. This book contains designs that were mostly invented by Barbara Walker. There were a few in here that were traditional, but most of these were things that she invented herself, including closed cable designs, which I um, did a technique video on this uh, earlier this week on Tuesday. Those books I use quite a lot. Um, the other two books that I reach for a lot are, um, I believe this is out of print, but you might be able to get it used. It's the Harmony Guide to Knitting Stitches. And you identify the different Harmony Guides because there's tons of them by the way the cover looks. A lot of the stitch patterns may have been recombined and produced in other books, but this one I use a lot. This one actually has color photos. This is a British book. So some of the, the knitting terms might uh, be more British than English. Um, but there are color photos of the stitch patterns. And again, they are written assuming that you are knitting flat. So if you want to knit in the round or you want it charted, you're going to have to, to do some work to do that yourself. But I really, the, there's something about this particular uh, stitch dictionary that is really compelling to me. There are just so many stitch patterns in here that I like. Uh, and which I, considering that it's not that big of a book, that's pretty nice that it has so many, so, that such a huge percentage of the patterns in here are ones that I like. Another one that I use a lot, I, this one is still in print, is the New Knitting Stitch Library by Leslie Stanfield, I believe, Stanfield. This is one, you know, I knit with cables a lot, and this is one that has some really interesting cables. What is different about this book 
is that there are a lot of stitch patterns that have very long repeats. That means they take a lot of rows before you get to the end of the repeat, which means that it could be nice for something like uh, blankets or scarves or something where you have a long piece of material. Uh, and it, the, and they're just, they're just interesting and different. And a lot of times I see things in here that I want to use that I can't because I don't quite have enough length for that. But there's plenty of things that are also have short repeats as well. And again, these have color photos. There's a nice index in the front of of all the different stitch patterns. So you can see the little thumbnail of them, and then they have a number, and that number is the is the. Uh, the pattern number, not the page number. So you can just quickly go through the book and find uh, which pattern you're looking for. And it is divided up into lace, cables, edgings, that kind of thing. Um, but this is this is a nice book. I really like this. Um, this is a, this is a different type of stitch dictionary. This is called Knitting on the Edge by Nikki Epstein. And what I this is this is stitch patterns that are really great. To, uh, to do on the edges of things. So at the bottom edge of a sweater or on the cuffs or the bottom edge of a hat or something along a hem of a dress or it could be something along the, the edge of a blanket, something like that. Stitch patterns that you will use that, that are more narrow and, and long instead. So in the, this book has got colored photos. Again, the they're written they're written instructions, written in rows. There's colored photographs. They'll have different kinds of edgings, and then they'll show it in something like usually a fairly simple sweater, and then they'll show you how the edging is uh, used on the bottom. They don't have the patterns for those uh, garments in here, as far as I can tell. But again, they tend to be fairly simple garments that are really uh, emphasizing what the edgings look like. So there are two sets of books that are were published in Bavarian German, which is a dialect of German. And one of them has been translated into English and is published by Schoolhouse Press. I have the original booklets. Um, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce them. Um, but these booklets, these are three little booklets and it's basically just uh, traditional stitch patterns of the Bavarian Austrian um, region, this valley where these Bavarian traveling tw twisted stitch patterns um, were used in traditional men's stockings and women's stockings. And they were preserved by this woman who went from museum to museum and personal collection and basically uh, uh, preserved all of these stitch patterns in this museum. And the booklets were originally published by this museum. And then they were distributed by Schoolhouse Press for a while and then they schoolhouse press had these translated into english there's not a whole lot of uh, words in here to begin with um, but she they had them translated and put into one volume called twisted stitch knitting so you you aren't going to get them in this uh, format unless i think maybe you could still buy them from the museum in germany or you could buy them used from somebody but you can get this in the form of a book in english called Twisted Stitch Knitting. So these books, and this three volume set, which is called Barely Stricken, there's, they come in a three set volume. Uh, it's another woman from that region who also set about preserving the stitch patterns from the area. This has a lot more history in it. It's got some really interesting things with stockings where um, the, the calf shaping, the, these stockings went up to the knee, and so there was shaping in the back of the cuff, like a, sort of an, uh, an oblong shape. And so she has uh, stocking patterns within here that have those um, calf gussets, uh, the directions for them. Now these are charted patterns, but they're not charted in, the, in a way that we are accustomed to. Each, each of these sets of booklets has a similar but slightly different way of charting these stitch patterns. And you can learn how, how to do them. There are little English cards in there that help you understand what the symbols are for. Um, I find it for myself easier to use um, my charting um, software and to rechart them so that I can easily look at them and know what I'm doing instead of having to look at the chart and think about it. And because these charts are in books, 
I usually want to recreate a chart or written instructions anyway on something that I can print out on my computer, whether it's written instructions or charted instructions, um, or if I have graph paper or something. I want these stitch patterns that are in a stitch dictionary to be in a separate piece of uh, paper for me so that when I'm using them, I don't have to keep flipping around on a book especially if I'm combining multiple stitch patterns from different books. I have um, done several designs using these stitch patterns and using them from a variety of these books. Uh, and so I would have recharted them. And in the patterns that I've published that have used these, I use modern um, charts that you would be uh, used to seeing so that it isn't a puzzle. But but they are worth getting. It's just an amazing uh, volumes of fantastic stitch patterns in these books. These books in my library are books I also use uh, for inspiration or to use stitch patterns directly from them. So I want to show you some of those books. One of the books is Alice Starmore's Erin Knitting. This is an updated edition. So she's got various sweater patterns in here and she's got a nice uh, history of Erin Knitting here at the beginning. So you could use some of the motifs or cable panels that she has in here however you want it in a different garment or she also has actual sweater patterns that's what's different about these books compared to the books i just showed you the ones i just showed you are actual just stitch dictionaries that for the most part don't include actual patterns those bavarian ones do include some stocking patterns and one of them includes i think a sweater pattern or a vest pattern or, or two in there but largely they're meant just as a source of stitch patterns what's different about these books is that they really have two purposes one is uh, some of them are are books by designers and so like alice darmore she designs uh, like cabled sweaters and she has a book that has the history of Erin sweaters in there and her own take on some of the Celtic designs and but she's got everything charted so if you see a stitch pattern that you really like in something a design of a sweater design that she or a pillow or a shawl or whatever and you want to use that the it's written here in chart form so you can just use this the stitch pattern itself. So that's what's different about these kinds of books is that you can use them basically as a stitch dictionary um, or you can use them um, to knit the, the actual garments that they have in, in those books. So I did, my video on Tuesday was on closed cables and Alice Starmore often uses closed cable designs. Like they're her original cable patterns, but she's using the technique that Barbara Walker created and showed in her charted knitting patterns or charted knitting designs stitch dictionary. Um, Alice Starmer used that technique to create her own cables. And um, Melissa Leapman has a book called Continuous Cables. She has a lot of closed cable patterns in here. These are uh, traveling cables of all types. She's got various types of projects in here, sweaters, pillows, various types of things. And again, she's got these stitch patterns charted. In, in this book, she, she uh, also has a chapter that's just stitch dictionary where she's just showing you the stitch pattern itself that's not in any sort of a garment. So this is a nice resource as well. I've got two other books here. These are both by Elizabeth Lavold. And she has taken Barbara Walker's idea of these closed ring cables where a cable can just start somewhere on the background of Pearl, start out of nowhere, um, and then end, disappear back into the Pearl background rather than starting at the edge and ending at the edge. Um, so those are these closed ring cables. Well, Elizabeth Lavold took that idea and and changed it quite a bit to create cables that were very similar to that but had a distinctly different look to them. I'll be talking more about this on, on next week's Technique Tuesday, the difference between what she's doing in her cables versus what Barbara Walker uh, created back in the 70s with her closed ring cables. I can show you a difference right here. I'm working on a design uh, myself. 
and I'm using, it's the same cable, it's the cable actually that's in this uh, sweater that I'm wearing, but, uh, but I'm trying it out as a closed ring cable so that it starts just in the background of pearls. And in one version, I'm using this cable pattern using Elizabeth Lavold's technique in the Viking Knits. Then the other one uses uh, Barbara Walker's method of closed cables, and they look very, very similar but there are some differences. This one tends to look more elongated, Lavold's method, and where what Barbara Walker's method tends to look more rounded. Elizabeth Lavold did did uh, some things that Barbara Walker and Alice Darmore do as well, where they they look at ex like artifacts, like Celtic artifacts. In her case, she's looking at uh, Viking artifacts and seeing these ornate designs on there, and then translating those into traveling cable patterns with closed ring designs. So Elizabeth Lavold's two books are. Viking Patterns for Knitting. And this is where she introduces her method of working these kinds of cables. And she, when any anytime she has a specific type of cable, she tells you how to work it as a single motif, how to work it as a motif that is has repeats in it, that it gets wider, or how to repeat it over a long period of time, you know, how to start it, how to end it, every kind of variation. So again, she has sweater patterns and mittens and hats and things like that that use these cables but then she has them charted out in all the different ways that you might want to use them and so you can use this as a stitch dictionary. Her second book was called Viking Knits and Ancient Ornaments so as a lot of the, the same types of cables again. I think this is probably the first book on traditional Aran knitting that I bought um, and it's by Sheila Hollingworth and this one is very much a stitch dictionary and I think it's got some sweater patterns in here as well. Yeah, it has some sweater patterns and hat patterns as well, but it's mostly a stitch dictionary and it, and it includes all of the sort of traditional Aran cable patterns. So this is a book that I definitely refer to when I'm designing uh, an all over cable sweater pattern, whether it's a traditional Aran or something, a subset of that, um, I will refer to this book as well. I want to show you some things that I have designed using stitch dictionaries and then kind of my approach to how I do that. Sometimes I go through a stitch dictionary and I think that's exactly um, what I want. And other times I think this is very similar to what I want, but not exactly. And so I'm going to take that cable and then figure out how I want to modify it um, to suit my purposes. So as part of the Master Hand Knitting Program, um, level three, you have to design a hat and you have to design a sweater. One of them has to be Fair Isle, one of them has to be Aran. So you get to decide whether you're going to do an Aran sweater in a Fair Isle hat or a Fair Isle sweater in an Aran hat. That's up to you. But you have to design them, knit them, and then write the patterns for them. So I, because I'm more interested in cables and Aran knitting than I am in Fair Isle, I chose to make the sweater an Aran sweater. And I, I designed this for my husband. You had to have a certain, at least a certain number of cables, and then you had to include bobbles as well. So this central panel, I wanted some sort of a, di a diamond type of thing, and I decided to, I think I put those bobbles in there. And I don't think that diamond pattern was one that existed as exactly that. It was something that I modified from a cable I found somewhere. And so... The diamonds that are side by side are filled with moss stitch. That's American moss stitch. It would be double moss or Irish moss in the UK. And then there are these little rope cables going up the center diamonds. And you'll see on either side, you have the rope cables flanked on there. Again, well, those, those little rope cables, those are four stitches. I wouldn't need a stitch dictionary for that. I would know how to do that. And then you'll see the next panels out, you'll see that it looks kind of like an S in the center. Those are cables that I got from Elizabeth Lavold's Viking uh, Knits book, I think. That was one I got from there. She calls them S Hitch. And then she'll have a right and a left S Hitch. And um, so those patterns can be created to be really wide if you want or 
or just uh, just that one motif going up in the center. So she has this S hitch in there. Well, that was a that was a design that uh, Barbara Walker had done in her charted knitting designs that she had created um, back in the '70s. But using her method, which is different and uses different stitch counts and, it, and it does it in different ways. So Elizabeth Lavell took something that Barbara Walker had created and then did her own take on it in a different way. And that's what I did when I looked at Elizabeth Lavold's book. I looked at what, how she had used things and then I figured out how to use them in a different way and apply them in a completely different garment combined with completely different stitch patterns. So that's kind of what design is. You're often borrowing one thing from that you see here or one thing that you see there. You might have a a garment shape that you like or an accessory that you like. You like the way it was constructed and you want to use different components and see how that works out. Um, that, that kind of thing as well. An example of, of taking one construction method and then combining a bunch of other elements to it is this little, it's like a little uh, shawlette scarf thing. So I don't know how well you can see. So I had knit a, a little scarf that had a similar shape um, the, as this. The, and the way that this was constructed is that you start with um, that, just that edging. You start with a provisional cast on, and then you work that edging all the way. And then you have live stitches at either end. You pick up stitches along the long edge of, the, of this bottom edging. You, pick up stitches and then you create the stockinette kind of crescent shape and then you switch to working um, the edging right here and when you're working this edging you're also creating the final repeat of this motif at the edge which is reversed over here so it's just a really interesting uh, construction method and I wanted to see what I could do with it and how I could use uh, different elements and and figure out reversing this edging stitch pattern so that you couldn't tell it had been reversed uh, and that kind of thing. So that was a, sort of a puzzle I was trying to solve. And so um, the edging, this edging pattern that I got at the bottom is from that knitting from the edge book. There was a, that little edging design um, was in there and it was in there in sort of a double decker sense and I figured out how to use just one element of it you know so I took I, I took what was existed I modified it I applied it to a construction method that I thought was interesting and then added other elements that were totally original so so that's how I use um, stitch dictionaries so this is another thing where I used in this case I used Elizabeth Lavold's books uh, with her Viking knits and I took different cables that she had and I started at the bottom and I the scarf got wider and wider and I switched to uh, wider and wider uh, cables all the way up until I got to the back and then I had um, just that standalone motif and then I reversed everything to go back down the other way. So the, the scarf starts out narrow at the bottom and it gets wider. And then um, I have a shawl collar on one edge. The, the ribbing was worked all the way around. And again, this was uh, something where I saw a shawl that was rectangular that had just the same cable pattern going all the way, the whole length of it. And someone had ribbing on the bottom and ribbing on the long top long edge. And she had done a little shawl in it. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's really interesting, but I would want to narrow the ends, have, you know, have the, have it get gradually wider and have the ribbon go all the way around. And then I wanted, would have to use different cable patterns and what would work well for that? Well, Elizabeth Lavold's cables would work really well for that. And, and that's how, how one thing followed the other in a design, in my design. A lot of times, you know, I'll borrow one idea and then change it. And then sometimes I will invent something of my own completely and then combine the whole thing together into something that I haven't seen before. So when I'm designing a sweater, I have 
a number of decisions to make. I have to make decisions about the stitch patterns that I want to make. I have to make a decision. Is it going to be a cardigan? Is it going to be a pullover? What is the neckline going to look like? And one of the most important decisions I have to make is what type of sleeve am I going to have? That is, how is the sleeve going to be joined to the body and what is that shaping situation going to look like? That is, am I going to have a raglan sleeve? Am I going to have a yoke body, upper body right here, a circular yoke? Am I going to have drop shoulder sleeves? Am I going to have a modified drop shoulder sleeve? Or am I going to have set in sleeves? Now there's even more choices than that, but, but those are the, are the main considerations. What type of sleeve to body joining situation am I going to have? And how is that going to be affected by the stitch pattern? Or how is it going to affect the stitch pattern and, and, and bringing the design all together? So it's a really important thing to think about. And because I typically really like complex stitch patterns, my choice most of the time is to start at the bottom and knit up. And the reason I choose that is because it's much easier to, easier to establish complex stitch patterns when you don't have any shaping. So you can get all of your stitch patterns um, established and figure out how, it, how it's gonna go. Once the shaping comes in above the underarm, you will have established the stitch patterns, you'll know what you're doing with those and you can really focus on the shaping. So that's, that's why I normally think about knitting bottom up. One of the things about top down knitting is that the stitch patterns tend to be stockinette or something pretty simple. So I've knit some pretty complex top-down sweaters um, with simultaneous set-in set sleeves. So it's a kind of a complex um, beginning, but notice where the stitch patterning kicks in at the underarms, right before the underarms. When after the neck has been completed, that's when the stitch patterning begins. And this is pretty amazing uh, stitch patterning on the back. It's stripes, but it's short rows. And it's an amazing um, sort of feat of engineering this particular design. But it is very simple from the neck to the underarms so that the knitter can focus on getting the shaping correct. And I recently got a question from somebody who said she found a sweater pattern she really liked but it was knit bottom up and she wondered and she wanted to knit it top down and wondered how easy is it to convert and so i had a couple of answers in my head and tried to figure out what to say to her and the first the first answer was define easy <laughs> and the second one was if that's your question it's not going to be easy enough because any sweater shape, any type of sleeve and body combination uh, can be knit in either direction. If you have a sweater pattern that is knit where it's knit in pieces flat and it's seamed together, it's probably knit bottom up. That doesn't mean that if a sweater is knit bottom up that it's knit flat in pieces and then seamed. It just means that if it's knit flat and in pieces, it's probably knit bottom up. If a sweater is knit top down, it's probably written seamlessly. It doesn't mean it has to be. It can be knit in pieces flat top down. If you look at early sweater designs, for like the the fisherman's Gansey sweater. Those sweaters were knit with the body was knit in the round, so no seams, bottom up and to the neck. And then these shoulder straps were created that joined the to the front to the back. And then the sleeves were knit top down. So that was really a hybrid construction and it was seamless. The vintage patterns that I have been knitting in the past year, I, in the first 20 or so, 25 years of the 20th century, most sweater patterns, not all, but most sweaters were knit flat, starting at the bottom of the back. Then they were knit up to the shoulder, 
and uh, the back of the neck was bound off and then the fronts were knit top down. So there was no shoulder seam. So the back was knit bottom up and the front was knit top down and it was knit flat. And then the sleeves were knit flat from the top down. So there was again this hybrid construction, but this time it was seamed rather than seamless. So it wasn't until later decades that you started seeing uh, real dressmaker techniques being applied to sweater patterns and therefore they were knit in pieces just like uh, uh, sewing patterns would be and then they were seamed together. So when top-down seamless construction came about, it seems like there is this assumption that that was the only way you can knit seamlessly and that another assumption that if you're knitting bottom up, you're going to be knitting flat with seams and that is not the case. So, so then you get this idea that, th that the reverse of a bottom up sweater that's knit flat and has to be seamed is a top down seamless sweater and that is not the reverse. Top down seamless is the opposite of bottom up seamless and the opposite of bottom up flat and seamed would be top down flat and seamed. So if what you're trying to avoid is seaming, reversing the instructions isn't going to do that. And at the same time, if what you're looking for is avoiding seams, you can still do that while knitting bottom up. So there's no real way to know what the issue is with this sweater pattern. It could be the reason she wants top down is because she's concerned about how much yarn she has and that she's going to run out and wants to knit it top down in order to maximize the yarn usage and not run out in any key place. And that's a legitimate concern, but again, you wouldn't need to do a total reversal of the sweater pattern. You could probably reverse portions of it, namely the sleeves. I often knit the body of my sweaters bottom up and then knit the sleeves top down. But the stitch pattern that's being used in the sweater will factor into whether or not this is going to work. So her question really isn't answerable because there just isn't enough information. So what she needs to do is figure out what her question really is or what the problem with the pattern as it's written really is and then look for solutions for solving that problem. Well that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.